That's a yellow-billed cuckoo. That's one of the birds that uh, has really shown big declines over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, among the steepest of any. We divide these stopover habitat types into three categories, uh, those that birds use under really emergency circumstances, uh, when they've had a, a wind in their face all the way across the, the Gulf of Mexico. We call those fire escape habitat stops. Uh, there's some that are located along migratory routes and provide low quality resources, but at least get the bird to the next place. We call those convenience stores, the way humans have convenience stores along migratory routes. The Pascagoula is what we call a full service hotel. This is a place that a bird may come, spend several days, there's something for everybody. All kinds of different species will find their own habitat niche here. Without this rest stop, many more birds quite simply would die during migration from stress or starvation. One of the most charismatic bird species is the swallow-tailed kite. It's a large species, about as big as an osprey, 50-inch uh, wingspan or so migrates up from the tropics, and the Pascagoula is one of the national recovery areas for the swallowtail kite. Uh, this bird needs huge blocks of forest to survive. Uh, they're an absolutely gorgeous bird. They're uh, upwards of about 200 individual kites uh, each breeding season uh, after the nesting period. So the Pascagoula is of, of a great regional importance to that species. Its numbers are, are uh, low enough where there's concern all over its range. The uh, smaller bird songbirds like warblers and thrushes and oreos and vireos, just about all of them are under some sort of threat uh, across their range throughout North America and then their winter range in the tropics. And they need help in terms of uh, where we can save large pieces of habitat, places where they can stop and feed and rest, as well as places where they can nest. Besides supporting birds in decline and providing a vital resting stop, the Pascagoula's forests and estuaries support hundreds of thousands of other life forms. Many of them, like the yellow blotched sawback turtle, can only be found in this basin. The Pascagoula River, especially the lower part of the basin, is one of the largest protected natural aquatic ecosystems in the United States. And probably in terms of protection, one of the largest in the Western Hemisphere. Finding relief from the searing heat and humidity, aquatic biologist Paul Hartfield searches for specimens in the cooler waters of streams like Black Creek, one of the many tributaries of the Pascagoula. Oh, good. Fishing spider. They're called fishing spiders because they actually will catch minnows. This guy will get almost as big as my hand. If you look around here, um, this is on a par with uh, some of the swamplands in Belize or the Caribbean coastal lands of Costa Rica. This time of year, you can barely tell it apart. You've got these huge deciduous trees. It's, it's just as jungly as it can be, and the aquatic life is, is even more diverse than it is in Central and South America. It's an incredible place. The story of the land acquisition that contributed to the preservation of the Pascagoula is almost as incredible as the river itself. The Pascagoula is one of the largest protected river corridors in the United States, but it was just a few days away from a much different fate. The rescue is the result of a chance encounter between two men who had little in common at the time. Graham Wisner, a child of Mississippi wealth and privilege. For me, it felt like it was my swamp and my wilderness. And because my family had not cut it, it felt primeval, powerful, silent. 
and I fell in love with it, I think, the first day I went there. My daddy was a commercial fisherman. And Herman Murrah, an old-timer who made his living on the river, as his family had for generations. I told him I was getting real concerned about the future of this swamp because it took hundreds of years to grow this kind of timber. Wisner's family operated the Pascagoula Hardwood Company that controlled a large percentage of the Pascagoula Basin. However, the 50,000 acre tract of land went largely unharvested due to a family disagreement over its use. And my uncle believed that by leaving the forest alone, it would only appreciate in value. So through the years, from 1921 when we first purchased it, until the time I arrived in 1972, very little had been cut. And it was, if not a primeval forest, it was a very, very old growth forest. In the early 70s, Graham visited the untouched swampland during summer breaks from college. It was there that he met Herman Murrah. And uh, an old hippie, I called him. Graham Wisner come down here you know, with long hair and sandals and beads and what have you and and uh, he uh, we got sitting over on the river bank one afternoon got to talking and uh, every large paper company in the south was trying to buy it it was for sale and uh, if we didn't move quickly to try to save it it would all be lost because the only way you can timber that land is to clear cut it. And Herman was always terrified of what clear cutting meant to his swamp. I thought anything could be done in those days. And the country seemed like it was changing. And the environmental movement, which was still very, very young, was coming of age. I was full of idealism, crazy idealism. Though the plan may have seemed foolhardy then, Graham's unwavering dedication pushed him to confront the prevailing environmental mindset of the time. There really wasn't an environmental movement at all. Most Mississippians loved their natural heritage, but they thought the word environmentalist was almost the same as being a communist. So when I got down there and started talking about the need to preserve this particular wilderness, people thought I was half crazy. And he said, why don't your agency buy it? You know that we're going to sell it. And I laughed. I said, my Lord, the state of Mississippi would never buy nothing like this. Shortly thereafter, after meeting Herman, I traveled back to Washington to talk to various leaders in the environmental movement to see if I could get anybody interested in preserving the wilderness. I knew I just had a matter of days before the contract would be signed and we would have lost it forever. I knew I had to move quickly. And I knew that the key to it lay in Washington, D.C. And it was there that I went to the Nature Conservancy. It was a plan that would change the course of environmental politics in Mississippi and America to this day. Two-thirds of the Pascagoula Hardwood Company land was purchased by the Nature Conservancy and then sold to the state of Mississippi, the largest land acquisition for conservation and preservation in U.S. history at the time. One of the leading newspapers in, in uh, New York City carried it on the front page. Unbelievable, Mississippi. It's 32,000 acres for conservation, the state of Mississippi. And for years, Nature Conservancy people would go to California or they would go to some up Michigan and some other state and say, look, Mississippi, they spent $15 million and got 32,000 acres of land. And they said, if Mississippi can do it, we know you can. It's sort of a backhanded compliment, but they will all tell you that it was a start of the coordination of private funds and public funds for conservation. I think as the years go on, the Pascagoula track will be recognized 
more and more for its importance and significance because of the fact that, that it is remaining fairly stable uh, in, in its bottomland environment and its diversity, whereas so much of the property around it is converting to, uh, you know, to the monoculture. And so, uh, properly managed, the Pascagoula tract will only become more valuable as the years go on from a, a recreational standpoint, from an aesthetic standpoint, from a scientific research standpoint, you name it. This unlikely chain of events assured that a large portion of the Pascagoula River Basin remained intact. It is a place not just of one kind of habitat. It is swampland, freshwater marsh, river, forest, and bayou. The bayous of Mississippi and Louisiana are legendary. Formed as inlets from the Gulf of Mexico, the bayous and marshes are filled with water that seems motionless. This is one of the key characteristics of this part of the ecosystem, very slow moving water. So slow that only an alligator that glides over the water seems in motion. It's a spot on this earth that man has not yet been able to mess it up. John Hudson raises alligators in the Pascagoula Basin. He's come to respect the dangers and the unique nature of the marsh. I think the marsh is the last frontier of unspoiled uh, domain of man because it's so hard for him to do it. It's so hard to, to get a piece of equipment out here. And then anything that's heavy enough to tear up the ground will just get stuck. There's muck holes here that uh, if you were to get off and start walking across here, there would be places that be only six inches deep and the ground's nice and hard. And you might make 50 steps like that. And then all of a sudden, you better lay down on your stomach because you've stepped off in what we call a muck hole. And you just, you would just keep on going down. It's not like quicksand, it would not pull you down, but it is so soft that you would have to go across that muck hole like the alligator goes across, dragging your stomach, dragging your belly on the mud and pulling with the hands and pushing with your feet. Just just like the old alligator gets across it, 